introducing our speaker tonight, Professor Chris Greenwell at the University of Durham Earth Sciences Department. Chris is a, a chemist by training. Uh, he completed his PhD at the University of Cambridge in 2003 using green chemistry principles to prepare heterogeneous catalysts and he studied their reactivity using computer simulations. This was followed by a post at UCL using massive computational simulations to obtain mechanical and structural properties of clay polymer composite materials. That was a mouthful. Um, in 2005, looking for a new challenge, uh, he ran a self-funded group at the School of Ocean Sciences at the University of Wales, developing microalgae biofuels for Shell. And in 2007, he joined Durham University as the Addison Wheeler Fellow, studying Earth geochemistry. In 2010, he was made lecturer in geoenergy at the, at the University of Durham again, uh, Department of Earth Sciences, rising to professor in 2015. Uh, his special interests are surface, uh, the surface chemistry, the structure and properties of layered minerals, and uh, in particular, and he has a wide range of other interests that include astrobiology, which I'm really excited. We should have another lecture on that one day, drilling fluids and bioenergy. He joined the Council of, the, of NIMI uh, a year ago as a non-corporate member. And just uh, uh, at our last council meeting a couple of weeks ago, he agreed to become a fully corporate member and a trustee of the Institute. His lecture tonight is A Time of Waste, Sustainable Environmental Geoscience Solutions. So I'm handing you over now to Chris Greenwell for our lecture tonight. Chris. Thank you very much indeed for that kind introduction, Rick. And thank you to all at NIMI for inviting me to speak this evening. All right, I'm just gonna bring up my screen and hopefully, okay, we will be able to see my slides. Okay. So has that appeared, everybody? Yep, I'm getting some nods, great. Okay, so um, my lecture this evening is uh, entitled A Time of Waste, Sustainable Environmental Geoscience Solutions. And in case you're wondering what on earth the picture is, uh, for those of you not familiar with it, this is a, a scene from the um, Pixar film uh, WALL-E, and the little droid with tracks in the foreground was left on a, uh, plundered planet Earth amid piles and piles of human debris and waste, searching literally for green roots of uh, plants that have managed to grow again on our polluted planet. And that's what he's holding up to be scanned by this uh, other robot that's being sent back from the human population now on spaceships to check whether it's fit for human habitation again on Earth. Um, so uh, just, just as, in this uh, film, it, what I'm going to talk about tonight is, is how we begin to understand um, to in, ensure we can both clean up the effects of some of our past industrial activities and how we make sure that we do it in a sustainable and economic way, such that it will continue being cleaned up rather than left to somebody else's problem. Uh, the title is a little tongue in cheek. As Rick introduced me, you'll have gathered I don't have a conventional geoscience background and I'm quite convinced indeed that many of my colleagues think a lot of what I do is a waste of time. So by simply transposing the words, we have the title, a time of waste. And indeed, with the emergence of the circular economy in recent years, it's become a very topical subject. And the circular economy is where we don't look at things that are coming out of processes as waste or byproducts. We try and feed them back into a process such that we begin to remove waste streams and turn them into valuable assets. Now, while that's a laudable ambition, what we shall see at the start of this talk is that there's an elephant in the room, and that elephant is exactly what do we mean when we talk about waste? What is waste? I mean, notionally, we can all understand what waste is. It's the kind of stuff we throw out every day, but unfortunately, it goes a bit further than that. Now, before I get to that, however, just to stall you and build up the uh, uh, ambition, uh, the, the tension a moment, so I'll just get my thanks in at the beginning. So if I do overrun a little towards the end, um, then it means I won't neglect anybody. So I'm blessed in my research team to work with a, a great number of um, non-academic organizations and we do lots of joint work with industry. 
a large part of my team works with the oil and gas sector, but the ones here that I'm going to introduce tonight are, are the, the other side of what we do. So we work with a, a great team of people over at Northumbrian Water Limited, um, Brian, Andrew, Laura, Matt and Chris. Uh, we work with people at CA, the Coal Authority, so Chris Attersley and Nick Cox, who's the metal mine specialist, Hugh Potter at the Environment Agency, um, and Tom and Pete at Natural Resources Wales. They've all input in some way or another into the work that you will see tonight. And the people who actually did the work, of course, uh, those on the right-hand side, the various members of my team, uh, mainly masters and even undergraduate project students who've worked on these things over the years, and the kind people who funded me again, are listed at the bottom there. So I mentioned that the elephant in the room is waste. Now, thankfully, or, or not depending on your view on government uh, documents, the government has tried to help us understand what waste is by issuing this uh, excerpt. This is an excerpt from a legal definition of waste guidance. And, and it seems almost quite clear. So a material is considered to be waste when the producer or holder discards it, intends to discard it, or indeed is required to discard it. Now that fits with that intuitive idea of what waste is, which we uh, introduced earlier, something that you will throw away at the end of its life. So when assessing whether a material is waste or not, discarding doesn't simply mean throwing away or getting rid of something. Discarding also covers activities uh, and operations such as recycling recovery operations, which put waste material back to good use. And that's our kind of ambition. We're going to try and recycle this waste in some way. So situations when a material is considered to be a waste include when it is mixed with another waste material. So this might be something like a coagulant or ochre in with sewage sludge. Once it's mixed with a sewage sludge, which is a waste, the other material becomes a waste. Uh, some, something that's been uh, deliberately and illegally abandoned or dumped, so fly tipping, it's been a, a problem during lockdown, of course. Or accidentally unknown or involuntary discarded, such as leakage underneath a, a fuel station storage tank. And there are companies in the northeast which, of course, specialise in cleaning that up and restoring old sites, including uh, FWS consultants of our chair. Um, and something which is required to be discarded by law. So that, that sounds straightforward. However, the government, just to uh, try and uh, help us further, states a material is likely to be waste, and so not definitely is, but is likely to be waste if it's left over, unwanted, or a burden on the producer. So this will cover, of course, things such as the extractive industries produce, um, the, the spoil and material which isn't, is discarded when the ore is processed. Something can, can no longer be used for its original purpose, is out of date or has become damaged or unsustainable for use. So this may be things like food waste, medicines, which are out of date. We also have things which we, we can define things which might be a waste. So this is not likely anymore, but it might be if it's a production residue, has a low or negative economic value, um, or it's hazardous or could pollute if we're talking about things like radiation waste that we've seen in, in prior talks from the Institute. Okay, so is that straightforward enough about what a waste may be? Now, the problem comes with trying to do something like you make a circular uh, economy type approach to using a waste, in that because what we've just gone through legally defines a waste, it's not very easy just to take a waste and turn it into something else, as it turns out. Um, for a start, if you had a uh, several tons of waste overburden delivered to your house, you've suddenly become a waste handler and that's subject to all sorts of legislative constraints. So in order to be able to use a waste, as legally defined by a waste by the government, you actually have to achieve another piece of legislation called end of waste legislation. And it turns out this is a huge bottleneck in actually using waste materials such as spoil materials for other purposes. So the end of waste framework, uh, tells you that uh, specified waste shall cease to be waste when it has undergone a recovery, including recycling operations, and complies with specific criteria to be developed in line with certain legal conditions. So in particular, the substance is commonly used for specific purposes, so it must have a definite and identifiable use for it to no longer be a waste. There must be an existing market or demand for it, and the use is lawful, and the substance or object fulfills the technical requirements for the specific purposes. So it must fulfill a set of technical criteria. So if you're processing a waste, you must get it to the same standard each time you process it. And that's actually more difficult than you might expect, depending on the nature of that waste. So uh, we can go on. Um, the test for end of waste 
is whether the waste has been converted into a distinct and marketable product. This means the waste has been turned into a completely new product, and you might see this in playground surfaces or road surfaces from waste fires, for example. The new product is different from the original waste. Um, Non-packaging plastic recycled material is processed into new plastic products, as an example. There is a genuine market, so this stops the kind of shipping of waste, of course, over to places like Indonesia or Malaysia, um, when it's picked up as recycling. Uh, that's problematic. I've actually seen that in the flesh, and it's not very pleasant at all. Um, the processed substance can be used in exactly the same way as a non-waste. The processed substance can be stored and used with no worse environmental effect. So it's all very specifically tied up in legislation. So the circular economy is a very nice idea that you have to turn back to law to look at, to understand what the obstacles are to actually achieving it. So we've, we've kind of talked in a legalistic way about wastes. We're interested in geo type material. So what sort of geo wastes do we have? Now, I used to live around the corner from this. These are the uh, slate tips up in the um, Slamberis Valley. This is just below Dinorwick in uh, North Wales. So this was a, a huge center for UK slate production on many of the roofs and exported widely. And these are just the, the, the processing wastes that are left over from that extraction process. Um, and these are vast. They are absolutely staggering. They have their own peculiar beauty, but they are huge deposits of material which are no longer needed. You can see the old skipways and winding gearways on that and, and the access roads up and down there. Oops. Um, there are mining wastes. This is uh, Eskair Moin in the, the uh, central region of Wales. Um, this was an old z uh, zinc mine, um, no longer there anymore. And you can see the, the spoil heaps behind it have been there since the uh, end of the 20th century, perhaps a bit earlier. And a lot of the, the old mining uh, infrastructure is there. Uh, just to the left, which I've carefully not put in the photo, is a, a very old Fiat Uno, which is in the middle of that pond. And uh, quite how it got there short of being dropped out of an aeroplane, I have no idea. These are the Edinburgh Bings. So these are the, the processing waste from the Lothian oil shales, massive heaps. Perhaps uh, studies have been done to see if we can get um, strategic metals needed in today's technology out of those, uh, but the cost of processing them could easily exceed the value of the materials within them. Um, we also have a lot of shellfish processing waste around the UK. Um, the challenge with this is it's in very, uh, tends to be produced on the coast in very small quantities, and so though there is a large amount of it, it's very hard to economically recover it to a central location to do something with it. And EU legislation actually prevents its original disposal route being used anymore. So this is a, a problem that's been building over a number of years of what to do with this um, when legally you can't do what you used to do with it, but there is no other way of treating it. Uh, this is a photo from Saltburn Gill. Um, this was a breakout from an ironstone mine, and when it's reached the air, it's formed this material called ochre, which we'll see later. And though there is now a treatment scheme there, um, there are still large sludge deposits of this down, down the Gills uh, Valley. Uh, this is the Slade Colliery near Wrexham in northeast Wales. And these huge tips that you can see on the right have now largely been grassed over, but you still notice them off the side of the A483 road. Um, there's a, a, a slightly interesting aside to this when I was uh, looking for a photo from this area. Uh, apparently there was a saying in, in Slay Corley, it was one of the more dangerous of the uh, Welsh collieries in the northeast region. And it uh, went along the lines that you might join the Navy to see the world, but if you join Slay Corley, you see the next. So um, that's an idea of how dangerous it was. Uh, you have the um, another material we'll introduce in this talk, which is uh, seaweed. Now, this is beach cast seaweed, so it's broken free and it washes up on Douglas Beach, which is on the, the right there and other places around the country. Now, all of that seaweed begins to break down and rot and it attracts flies and causes an environmental problem. So the councils have to spend thousands of pounds each year um, getting rid of it. But it's a potential resource that remains to be tapped. And indeed, in the old days, uh, the farmers would have taken it away and put it on the soil as a soil improver, but that practice has fallen by the wayside over time. Oops. Um, Northumbrian water seal sands work, um, treatment work. So again, sewage sludge is a, a big waste product. A lot of that now goes back to the land, so that does have an end of uh, waste usage. Uh, below again, mining wastes you can see in, in the stream bed there. 
So, um, in, in this, the next stage of this talk, we're going to look at use of uh, a particular iron mineral for, which is on the right there, these are um, a type of uh, iron oxyhydroxide for recovery of nutrients from wastewater. Now, I first uh, was introduced to this topic in France. I used to work for a while at the Institute on the bottom left there in the town above, which is um, Nancy in Northeast France. And the French have a big problem with uh, eutrophication, so oversupply of nutrients to their floodplains, which then flows down to the coast and uh, causes uh, seaweed blooms. So um, here's a, a simple schematic of it. You have all of these, uh, don't know, yeah, can you see the pointer on the screen now? I hope so. Uh, so you have agriculture, you have water treatment works, you have uh, domestic supplies, industry, uh, fish farming, all of these things will result in nutrients being released into the environment. And in the natural environment, you tend to have oxygenated waters. Um, but where you get eutrophication, what happens is you get blooms of algae which die. And as they decay, they remove the water from the, the oxygen from the water. The water becomes anoxic. Uh, you get reducing conditions. So you can get the formation of hydrogen sulfide and you get um, anoxic sediments and unstirred lower waters and a lot of mortality of the creatures that would normally live there. And these are the kind of problems that they've had. So the, the impacted regions in France along the Brittany coast here, and you end up with these massive blooms of seaweed, uh, a type of seaweed called Ulva lactuta, which then gets washed up on the shores. And as it begins to die, um, oops, it, it decays and it releases or gets pockets of hydrogen sulfide gas and it can indeed, it's so toxic that dogs sniffing in it might die or even pigs that have come down onto the beach to eat it. Um, one of the first projects we did on this was uh, a local student who was working in my group and um, here's an aerial photo of Saltburn Gill as it was before the treatment scheme. And you've got uh, one stream which comes down here, which is not polluted and Coming along here, you have Saltburn Gill itself, which has this iron, rusty colored iron oxyhydroxide ochre material in it. And they naturally mingle. And we thought, as the French researchers were looking to use iron oxyhydroxides to remediate the water in France as a phosphate scavenger, we thought we'd have a look if we could use this as a natural model in the UK to see whether it worked or not. Now, for various reasons, the data from that was uh, a mixed bag of results. So what we did, we thought we'd be more systematic and look at designing a research project to test this. Now, as it happens, the uh, northeast of England has a, a uh, ochre overproduction problem. There are many acid mineage drainage sites where they have to uh, remove ochre from the water because as the dissolved iron comes out of the mine, it reacts with the air to form the ochre, which is a mix of these iron containing minerals. And it forms these orangey type sludges, which you see at the bottom, which are unsightly. And as we saw in the above uh, picture, they can, they can um, make a river look very polluted. And also they tend to coat all of the plants and other things within it to the extent that they are unable to function properly. So, as the Northeast produces many tons of ochre, we thought we could see, can we take some of that and use it in water treatment processes? One of the biggest production facilities for ochre in the Northeast is at the Dorden Wine Water Treatment Plant. Um, and here you can see the, if we look on the bottom left, uh, mine water essentially comes in, there's some heat recovered from it in a heat exchanger, oops. And then it's uh, oxidized in these tanks to generate the ochre the iron oxyhydroxides from the dissolved iron two. It starts to oxidize to iron three and forms a, a uh, mineral. And that begins to precipitate out and then it's removed on these filters, pH adjusted to get even more of it to precipitate out. And then it's taken away, partially dewatered and taken away to landfill at a cost of probably in the region of, of, of 100 or so pounds a ton. And some of that will of course be water. So it's an expensive thing to get rid of. And also it has to go in a certain grade of landfill which is becoming diminished. So uh, we were interested in, can we take this and put it in water in some form at a water treatment works to remove the phosphorus from the water which is a nutrient which causes problematic eutrophication. Um, so we did small scale experiments uh, working with Northumbrian water. 
um, to make ochre in conjunction with different resins and cements to bind it together to see whether it would remove phosphorus efficient. Uh, and the answer to that, uh, sorry, was yes, when you did these things, you could get quite a high removal efficiency using these very small filters here. We've packed these with ochre, flooded water with phosphorus from the top and measured the removal. So the next question is, can you do this at a scale which makes sense to a water treatment work? So we have to think a bit bigger. So we'd taken some of these kind of pond filter size units up on the upper left there. Um, we put a granular material uh, gravel in the bottom and then we coated some sand with ochre um, to give it some pore structure. It's very fine grained on its own. And then we put the ochre coated sand in the filter and we flowed water through it. And um, we looked at factors such as the different depth. And these, this graph at the bottom right shows you a percentage of samples as a histogram of phosphorus removal, uh, measuring the total phosphorus uh, and the filtered phosphorus um, with either five centimeter bed depth on the left or 15 centimeter bed depth on the right. And most of the material was sadly only removing about 10% or so of phosphorus at the shallower bed depth and slightly more at the deeper bed depth, unsurprisingly, because it had a, a bigger path length to pass through. So we thought, okay, so if we're making it deeper, we're getting some more phosphorus removal. So we then made it at a meter scale, uh, sorry, a cubic meter scale using an IBC, an industrial bulk container. Inside that filter system, we had a, some filter bed tiles, some sand, and then one part ochre to four parts sand, and then another sand top on it. And we filtered the water from the waterworks, which had some phosphorus within it, through it to try and remove that phosphorus as phosphate. And what we found as we started it on the 11th of July 2016, and we monitored it regularly, and after about a week, we'd reach a minima of phosphorus removal. Um, we'd start off removing quite a lot, and it would drop down to about 10%, suggesting after a week you might need to uh, reflush it. So here is where it's been um, given a stir and started up again, and then you get a little bit more phosphorus removal. So when we had a look at the runs of this, Again, it's a histogram, so total and filtered phosphorus in the continuous color and the, the part shaded color, and the percentage of samples removing a certain amount. So most removal was within the, the sort of 20 to 50 percent, with a few more at 50 percent. Um, so yes, it, it's removing quite a lot of the phosphorus, but not a huge amount, or not as much as we hoped. Now. One of the other things that was problematic about this approach of mixing um, ochre with the sand to give you a granular material is you've converted one part of waste material into five parts of waste material. So you've actually increased your waste five, fivefold effectively to be able to dispose of. So in retrospect, it probably wasn't the most well thought out uh, idea for taking forward. Nonetheless, there are some parts of the world where they do do this and remove phosphorus and phosphate or phosphate rather from, from sewage water using ochre coated sand. Um, we then looked at, okay, well, if we're not gonna use it as a filter, can we just take the granular material because it tends to disperse very easily and add it into a water treatment works um, at the front end of the process and then remove it in the sedimentation. So we looked at how much ochre dose um, versus percentage removal of phosphorus uh, phosphate and we want to get up to 70% removal and we find out we're as we add more and more ochre so when we're up to about one and a half grams per liter of ochre you're getting towards the phosphate removal you want okay um, and then we looked at ochres to see what difference it made um, from different mine water dewatering systems across the northeast so Akon, Bates, Blenkinsop, Dorden, uh, Saltburn is the odd one out of course as it's a metal mine rather than a coal mine and then the percentage removal of both total phosphorus and filtered or soluble phosphorus. Now, on the left hand side, just to give you an idea, is what happens if you use just ferric salt. So this is soluble iron, and that's what the water industry uses as a standard approach to this. Now, one of the other things you have to consider, of course, is that if you're adding ochre to the system, you're adding more than just soluble iron, you're adding the iron oxyhydroxide, so you're generating more sludge again, and that sludge disposal has to be factored into. So whereas it looks good in initial trials, when you look at how much extra sludge it's likely to generate, and therefore how much extra waste 
the company might have to dispose of, it begins to look less attractive. So um, this is percentage removal of uh, phosphorus, phosphate rather, ODF is ochre derived ferric. So we went back a, a step and almost the, went back to where we started off with. If the best material was insoluble ferric salt, we thought, why don't we just take our ochre uh, as a concentrated source of iron, dissolve it up in a concentrated acid and reproduce a ferric salt. So here is ferric sulfate, which is what the standard way of removing phosphate is in a water treatment works with phosphate consents. We then looked at different ochre derived ferrics, so dissolving, look, dissolving the ochre up to make it back into a soluble iron salt and its efficiency against um, the standard way of doing it. And we indeed find that it's a very, probably the most effective way you can use ochre for a phosphate removal process in a water treatment works um, without generating lots of extra waste along the way, which is something we're keen to evolve. We should be removing waste, not actually generating more of it. Now, the nice thing about this is it then doesn't need to be landfilled. It will go through the sludge processing works and can be disposed of um, through that process. And we did a lot of um, work looking at ways we could scale this up. And we eventually managed to take it to a reasonably large scale trial. There are some photos on the next slide. And what we found was that a concentration of iron of about 10, um, 10 to 12 milligrams per liter, we could get um, significant removal of phosphorus. This is the amount of phosphorus left now, not the phosphorus removed. And um, by monitoring the pH, you have an idea when it's reached that optimal position within the treatment. The water treatment works then at pH adjust back. They don't discharge pH three waters. Obviously, they adjust back to a neutral pH within the works. And here is Sunderland Bridge water treatment works. And we ended up making um, many tens of liters of our ferric material from ochre and dosing the water on site uh, to do a long term trial on that. So we'd sort of gone in a very circular way to going from processing ochre back to a material very close to what the water companies would use naturally uh, with well-defined properties. And therefore it's a way of achieving end of waste certification because it has a definite use. It doesn't look like it did before and it has a measurable set of performance characteristics with it. Okay, so second part of the talk. Um, this is going to look at metal mine remediation using sustainable natural materials. So this is a, a photo of a mine I've spent a lot of time at, which is Cumastwith in Wales, for those of you who uh, may, some of you may recognize this. Um, so as a context, uh, metal mines are a feature of many of the rural landscapes of England and Wales, the North Pennines, the Lake District, uh, the, the Mid Wales Valleys, and of course in Cornwall as well. As many as, as prices decreased, uh, many of these mines became unviable back in the early in the 1800s and through to the early to mid 1900s. Um, they were abandoned. Uh, there was no legislation then in place to enforce the the owners and operators cleaning up. And as I mentioned at the bottom, in Wales alone, there are um, over a thousand abandoned metal mines uh, of various sizes. The Cumastwith one is is quite a big one. The feature in the photo on the top right there is um, called Bryn Copper, which is Welsh for Copper Hill, and there's thought of being mining on that site from about the uh, Bronze Age onwards. Um, so in, in these mines, what has happened after, when they were operating, of course, the lower levels were pumped dry, so there was no water in the mines. The ore bodies are exposed during mining operations. Uh, when the mine was abandoned, uh, they've slowly filled up through groundwater infiltration. All of the workings are flooded. That water has oxygen in it. It's reacted with the metal sulfides, which are the primary ore minerals. Those metal sulfides have dissolved to form sulfuric acid, which catalyzes even more metal dissolution. The oxygen gets removed from the water and you end up with sulfuric acid, dissolved metals and very low oxygen. And when it arrives at the uh, surface, it reacts with oxygen in the air and we get our friend ochre being precipitated again, iron oxyhydroxides. But what you can't see, of course, is in the even clear looking water, there is still a high level of lead and zinc and cadmium. In some mines, there's also nickel, depending where you are. Now, the particular challenges with remediating these mines, um, if we look at where they are using our nice uh, lit image of the UK on the right, the Mid Wales ore belt is here, the Pennine ore belt is here, the lakes mines are over here, 
what's conspicuous about them is they happen to be about bang in the middle of patches of blackness. And that's because whereas there were thriving communities there in the day when they were operating, now they are some of the, the remoter parts of the UK with very small populations. Uh, and intriguingly, uh, as you drive through parts of Wales, you'll notice disproportionately huge chapels where the Methodist workers would have worshipped in their heyday, uh, serving villages of about 10 houses or so. Uh, so this is the Ustwith Valley to give you an idea of the, the, the emptiness of it. Um, the little hamlet of Cummuth, which is behind us, and this is looking towards Ryada. And you could probably count the number of properties as you drive for 20 minutes along that valley on one uh, hand. Um, this is in near Eggleston, top end of Eggleston Burn, again, a very remote area up in the Pennines. So these are far away from anybody. There's very little in terms of power, security or uh, population to operate any kind of treatment scheme in these areas. So what we're going to look at is an example of uh, phyco remediation. So phyto would mean plant, phyco means algae. Uh, algae are, are kind, uh, people are familiar with. It's the green stuff that grows in water that's left on your windowsill. Um, and you, it's, it's sort of uh, one of the most uh, simple but efficient organisms for converting CO2 into biomass. Now, simplistically, there are two kinds of algae. There are macroalgae, as in big algae, which are seaweeds and kelps and, and uh, so on. So uh, they are characterized here. They have a hold fast. They tend to grow on rocks. So some may be free, free growing, such as uh, Fagassi. Um, you have a stipe, uh, sometimes a gas bladder to try and keep it buoyant in the water in the photic zone. And then the, the blade, which the upper part makes up the fronds. Microalgae are single cellular uh, microorganisms. Um, there's some compositional differences. These tend to have a lot of oil in them, which is why people have been interested in them for biodiesel and biofuel over the years, including the work we did with Shell. Um, and then the macroalgae, people have been interested in, they're quite sugary, so you can um, get them to ferment and digest, uh, although there are, there are some drawbacks to trying to use them for that sort of fuel product, but that's another story for another day, perhaps. Uh, in terms of the seaweeds um, or the macroalgae, which we'll focus on for the rest of this talk, um, they're the greens, the reds and the gold, simply put. Um, you can, if you, if you uh, regular trips to the northeast coast, you'll see all of these things. Um, some of the rocks around um, Kettle Ness and, and on the, the um, ironstone out that way are covered in pinky and reddy algae. Um, the green you'll find grown around stays, so the gold, you, the browns you'll find grown around stays, uh, fucus and so on in the harbour. And the chlorophyta you might see down on seal sands where it's been a particular problem. Now, one of the interesting things about seaweeds in terms of biogeochemical cycling is that if you compare the seawater levels of certain metals, they're given in blue here, to the ones found in two, the era two, this is Fucus vesiculosis and Ascophyllum nodosum. They're two types of commonly found shore seaweeds. And what you find is when these organisms are living, they actually concentrate metals hugely relative to the seawater that they're found in. They will take up these metals and store them within their um, biomass. So zinc, manganese, copper, nickel, uh, this all looks good. We did some work and, uh, a few years ago on looking at rhenium in these, these biological organisms. And rhenium is actually stored at about 10 to the five times its background level in, in macroalgae, huge amounts. And people, because of this affinity for metals and ability to store metals, people have begun to use them in places where, like British Columbia. I read last year, there was an article where they were actually looking at the seaweeds to try and understand which rivers might have ore bodies discharging into them. So you can use them as a kind of a quick pass at mining. Now, a little bit of chemistry, but I'll try and uh, not go into too deep, is the reasons that um, these organisms store metals is quite unique. So they're made out of a sugary starchy type material, but unlike um, terrestrial plants, they don't have any lignin or cellulose in them. They have something called alginic acid, and that has acid groups on it and that is part of the reason that they are able to store metals. It's also part of the reason that they're very hard to break down in fermentation and um, by microbes who are used to terrestrial systems. They are a sort of chemistry that's not found very much on land except in fruit peels. And this biopolymer can form particular structures like these little cup shapes. And those cup shapes are very, very good at binding metals within them. 
and they form something called an egg box model. So the intuitive way to think of these is when you take your two halves of an egg pork apart, you have those nice pockets that your eggs sit within. Well, this is where your metal ions will sit within the structure of this biopolymer. And it hangs onto them very well indeed, which is why you get those elevated uh, functions. There are other biopolymers such as fucoidin, which has got sulfonate groups in it. Again, very rarely found in land-based organisms, but quite common within marine because sulfate is one of the abundant anions in seawater. Um, so the people have looked at where this uh, bio, the, the seaweed store the different metals by looking at removing um, some of the cell wall material to see if it makes a difference. And certain metals seem to be mainly stored in the cell wall. If we look at nickel, when you remove the cell walls from the biomass, it doesn't store very much um, nickel as compared to the normal cells. Cadmium, some is. Lead, it has an extraordinary high affinity of either with or without its cell wall removal. And the cell wall is where a lot of the alginic acid is. So there are other things within them and a whole group of compounds have been identified called phytochelatins, uh, which will bond to metals such as cadmium and lead as well. So overall, these, these uh, seaweeds seem to have been, you know, they have an incredibly high affinity for metals of various kinds. And people have tried to harness this in, in to put it simply, for removal of metals from wastewater streams that are using a fairly low tech approach. So what you can do is you can take your seaweed biopolymer, you can cross-link it with calcium to form a nice gel so it's resilient, it's like a slightly squishy plastic ball. You then put this plastic ball within a canister on the left-hand side here. You flow your metal contaminated water into it. The seaweed biopolymer will remove all of your metals and you get clean air water out depending on which metal you want it. Now over time you'll fill your um, absorbent up with metals and it becomes less effective. And what you can do then is wash it with acid and add a bit more calcium, regenerate it, and then you get a concentrated metal solution out the other end, as opposed to the dilute one which you were originally putting in. So filters, uh, there's some important considerations. We get a little bit into an engineering site here, and I found this was all new to me when I started working on this because we're used to doing things of small scale in the lab, and we start to have to think about more large scale things. Uh, such as pore volume, the bed volume, the breakthrough volumes turns out to be a very important filter uh, property. So as a chemist, I might be interested in absorption capacity. How much metals will this thing hold if I keep pushing it in there? But as it turns out, that's not as useful as knowing when will we start to see how many volumes of water do we have to flow through before we start seeing metals going up in the outflow again? And that might be a different answer to what's the total absorption capacity of it because you'd have to put an awful lot of metal in to get anywhere near that, whereas you're starting to discharge metals far before that capacity. Okay, so we were asked to, we had this idea from our work on, on um, cycling of metals in seaweeds from both biofuel work and from both our uh, work on uh, geochemical cycling in marine systems. And we were asked to see if we could come up with some low cost ways of treating mine waters um, by the uh, natural resources whales. So we did some very small scale initial trial showed here. We were dripping our beads. You make a viscous solution. You pump it out of a needle to form a nice bead. And the bead falls through air, making it spherical. The old shot tower principle, if uh, anyone is aware of that, is how they used to make lead shot. And then it falls into a water full of calcium and it quenches. And you can see here the bead sinking down as it begins to set. And we end up with all of these beads, which we can use as our filter absorbent material. Um, so we looked at, uh, also looked at some fruit peels because that has a very similar material in it as well, but it turned out that it had the uh, sad consequence of going moldy quite quickly, which the seaweed derived polymer never did. Um, having shown, we, we did this small scale um, test and, and showed it work, we were then asked to consider some of the Kumas twist um, mine addits and we collected water from gills at it, which is the one that rises here. That one's non-ochrous. And then we also had pews at it, which is the ochrous one here. Now, uh, these plots are showing the levels of zinc. We have different waters. We have gills at it water, which is the darker blue color. So this line here, we have pews at it, which is the purple line. We also made a lab metal solution, which just had the metal of interest in it 
So there were no competing metals which would have been within the mine waters. Based on the higher values um, from the uh, long-term monitoring data of these sites, um, so that would have been looking very close to Pusadit in our lab metal solution, but Pusadit will have had all different metals in it, whereas our model one would have had just the um, one metal in it. These are the environmental quality standards or EQS. Now they vary according to water hardness, but for the purposes of this, both lines are shown. And at the, the scale here, you don't notice, but when you look at low concentrations, you can see there's a difference between the environmental quality standards, depending on whether you have hard or soft water. So we looked at um, how fast does, can we remove most of the metals from the solution um, using our absorbent material. So this is time along the bottom, concentrating, this is 20,000 uh, micrograms per litre or 20 mg per litre of zinc. And you can see within five minutes, you're removing well over half of the zinc. And within 10 to 20 minutes, you're getting on for 70 odd percent of it. I'm gonna speed this up a little bit. I'm conscious I'm running a bit behind. Um, so this is uh, 25. So this is the lead uh, now. So again, we can, um, no, that's cadmium. Yeah, sorry, it's lost its, uh, yeah, cadmium EQS. So this is a cadmium. We remove about 50%. The levels are far lower here. You're only looking at 25 micrograms per litre um, to begin with. But again, within five to 10 minutes, you're removing about half of it. Lead, I mentioned that these biopolymers have a high affinity for lead. Oh, there's the captions from the previous one. Uh, so lead absorption, within five minutes, you are removing well over 90% of the lead from the very high 900 or um, 0.9 milligrams per litre that was there originally. Um, and again, similarly, whatever the initial starting concentration within five minutes, which is an extraordinarily low retention time for a filter system, then you are removing a significant portion of that metal. And indeed, in summary, these are repeated the plots on the right, uh, but if we look on the left-hand side here, the black figures are the five minute removal times, uh, percentages rather, and the red are the 15 minute uh, residence time removal. So we, at 15 minutes, we're removing nearly 80% of the zinc, 70% of the cadmium, and 100% of the lead from the water, more or less within. Uh, we'll skip that. That was looking at velocities. We also had an initial look at how we desorb the metals, because of course we're going to have to recover the metals from these things at some point. Um, so zinc, um, you can desorb uh, a significant amount of it. So this is the amount absorbed to the bead. So you can see um, over time, we're beginning to dissolve more and more of the zinc from the, the bead. Cadmium as well, it was relatively easy to get off. Um, for lead though, it was much, much more tightly bound. And we've been doing further work to try and get the lead back out of those bead systems. Uh, we looked at various different commercially available alginate gels um, in, in an effort to try and speed up uh, larger scale trials. And we settled on um, Protonal GP540. It's just one of the commercially available alginates that you can buy at large quantities um, for doing larger trials. Uh, don't want to go through this in, in too many details, but I mentioned that breakthrough volume was important. Um, we originally thought that our filter beds would be defined by the amount of retention time that was needed, the size of the filter, because the longer you need to hold the water, the bigger your filter will need to be. But what we actually found out was that if you used a five minute retention time, which you could do, and you're, you can then get away with the smallest filters you can, what you have to do is you get your breakout volume within about two days. So you would have to be going back and regenerating your absorbent every two days, which given the remote nature of these um, is actually pretty impractical. So a key message we learned in this work was that the filter size is not necessarily determined by the retention, but by the amount of times you want to go back and service it in some way. And we also, as I mentioned earlier, showed that the percent of saturation of the beads at your breakthrough volume is far below the theoretical limit. So the actual full absorption capacity of the beads is a far less uh, useful quantity than the point at which it begins to break out. Um, and even if you did this well, you'd be recovering about two tons of uh, zinc per year, half a ton of lead and about a few kilos of cadmium from that particular addit. So the economics of it, you have to start then thinking about because that value of metal is not going to tot up hugely. Um, we actually then did 
a, a larger scale demonstrator study, which I'll come to. We don't need to, to linger on that slide. We had a, a quick check back at the prioritization of catchments on which ones were most impacted by metal mines to see that Kumasquith was an appropriate one to carry on with. And indeed, we found that Kumasquith, it's in this red line here, is impacted and it has a significant impact score. So on the environment agency priority uh, prioritization for treatment, these uh, waters are one that specifically need treating pretty urgently. And indeed, there have been further work done on these sites in the time that we've been doing our initial research project. Uh, give you a, a, am I okay for time for five minutes, Jeff? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so here's an overhead view, um, here's the Google Maps of the Ustwith catchment. This is the small road that comes down from uh, Kumasquith village. Uh, it eventually goes all the way through a particularly stunning part of the world to get to Ryada. Um, and here is the old mine workings. You can see the extent of the spoil heaps. Here's the old crushing floor. And here you can see our ochreous discharge. And this is the Avon Ustwith, the river uh, Ustwith, which flows all the way down to Aberystwyth at the coast. Now, when we looked at what size theoretically would a treatment system need to be, um, we worked out our size would be a 40,000 litre treatment system if we wanted to make a treat the whole added discharge at this site. And we thought, well, what's the footprint and that's going to look like? And as you can see, it's actually pretty small in the grand scheme of things compared to some alternative treatment systems that are out there, um, such as reed beds and other ways, but wouldn't work particularly well in this area because of the particular topography. Um, so this is the view again along the road. A nice thing about this site is, is even though it's in a remote location, you can actually get a vehicle quite close to it for setting up some research trials. Um, some of the things which aren't so ideal about this is it's a scheduled ancient monument. That's something that most people don't tend to think about when they're doing field work. So if you want to do any groundworks on site, uh, it actually has some historic value, so you have to get an archaeological survey done, depending on when you're operating. And you can see in the inset that our little adit that we want to use is actually within the scheduled ancient monument site. Now, the other thing is, is that it's also a site of uh, particular scientific, uh, specific scientific interest, the uh, uh, I. And um, the reason it is, is because there are lichens which will grow on the spoil heaps because of the unusual metal combinations there that are very rare and aren't found anywhere else. But as a result of those lichens being there, you can't disturb the spoil heaps. So you have to be fairly careful about where you put your equipment and access the site to get off. So we scaled up our tiny little lab experiment to this sort of scale. Um, now, I, one of the, the appeals is this site is it, it's uh, Anywhere else in the UK, the weather will seem good relative to it, in that even in the middle of summer, a really cold wind whistles up from the southwesterlies uh, coming up the Aberystwyth with valleys, uh, and frequently as well, um, it, it has the lovely Welsh feature of having five different kinds of rain in one day. Uh, I think in all my days I've been on that site, the only time, only one afternoon was it a beautiful still evening, and uh, as soon as we got out of the car, marveling at this uh, rare phenomena, we were almost completely devoured by thousands of midgets that had also seized the opportunity to be there. Um, so we actually ended up scaling up to a, a, a bigger system again, which I'll come to in a minute. And we were operating this over 10 to 12 day periods. And as you can see, what happens is you get a very, um, even over the 12 day period, you're not seeing a breakthrough of lead. This is measuring the concentration of lead in the outlet waters. So the, within hours, the level of lead has, this, has fallen considerably and it stays low all the way through the trial. Cadmium, it tails it off, but after 50 hours, you start to get a gradual increase again. So you're getting some breakthrough of cadmium. Zinc is an unusual one. It, it has a very rapid initial removal begins to build up again and then levels off. And we've been doing some research to try and understand how this happens. And, and that's quite, um, it's been noted once before in the literature. So it's quite an unusual phenomenon. It's not that it's going all the way back up to its initial value. It reaches a new stable removal rate of about 50%. The filter bed was scaled up eventually to, this is the biggest we've run to date. These are 250 liter filters. You can see all of those beads within there. Um, they're kept in place by some mesh. Uh, the whole thing's put on a pallet, and then we have a takeoff pipe from a, a V-notch weir to take the water into the filter unit. 
Now, um, this is a, when we put this filter there, it was not, there was a very, very heavy rainfall event. This was August last year. And within about four hours, the water was at the top of that filter, to give you an idea of the catchment hydrology in that region. So it was pretty spectacular. And we were slightly worried the whole thing was going to disappear to Aberystwyth from near rising waters. Um, we've just had uh, funding to take this up to a, uh, a annual trial on a unit four times this scale. So we're just doing some work now to put a bigger unit in it. And these, this sort of commercialization process is, is quite a long one. Um, we're having to demonstrate different principles at different scales. And each time you scale it up, it's a different challenge, such as how do you start to make these beads rapidly at large scale? How do you ship them into site and ship them out of site, et cetera? So overall, the idea is that we're going to take our beads, we're going to treat some water within them, we'll get clean water out, which doesn't actually have a value to anybody at the moment because we don't have a water market in the UK. We're going to treat them with metal to get the metals back out. We're going to do something clever with the metals to get some money out of it. We'll regenerate our bead and we'll go around that loop as many times as we can until we can't recycle them anymore. Then we'll ash them, recover any last metals out of them and make some new beads. And because they're made from a biomaterial, it means they're a sustainable, uh, low carbon footprint absorbent for metal removal. So slight problems to this. Uh, they'd like it to be economic and self-supporting. Market price per tonne of metals, this was a little while ago. Um, you're not going to make a huge amount of money if it's two, a thousand pounds a ton for zinc and you only recover two tons per addit. You're not going to make a fortune out of doing this. So we had to think about, well, that's a zinc metal, but uh, what else is in there that has value in it? There's the ecosystem. There's no actual price for that, but there is a, a notion that you can charge or clean enough to meet the European Water Framework Directive legislation, the environmental quality standards. And what might be nice is if you could turn your remediation problem into a manufacturing challenge and look at different materials. So zinc metal, it's worth about 1300 pounds per ton of zinc present in it. Zinc carbonate is worth slightly more because you're paying more per mass unit. Uh, zinc aluminium LDH, so these are nanoparticles my group does a lot of work on. They use for catalysis amongst other things. These are worth far more, getting up towards 10,000 pounds a ton. Uh, if you look at the zinc vulcanizing agent used in tires, that's worth a sort of similar order of magnitude. And then fine chemicals used in um, things like shampoos containing zinc are worth a massive amount per ton, but you'd never ever sell a ton of it. Of course, you sell them in small amounts. So in a sense, to make these things pay for themselves, you need to think about actually turning them into things of higher value and also a convincing reason you would use recycled mine water instead of just buying in a quarried zinc product. Okay, thank you very much. That's my talk. <laughs> Splendid, crikey, Chris, uh, fantastic! What a what a really interesting what a really interesting talk. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm sure there are plenty of questions uh, from our audience, and I'm going to hand over now to Matt Fennell, who's going to run the question and answer session. Thank you very much, Rick. Um, if you are joining us on Zoom this evening uh, and would like to ask a question, could you use the raise hand function or use a reaction or you can send me a message in the chat bar. If you're joining us on YouTube, if you could type your comment into the uh, live chat bar and I'll relay those directly to Chris. So does anybody have any questions for Chris at this point? Not anything yet. Oh. Bill, I've just asked you to unmute. Okay. Hi, Chris, that was fascinating. Um, just an aside, really, not, not technical, but um, will the EU waste regulations continue if we eventually um, extract ourselves from, from the EU, the evil empire? Uh, given the government's uh, cavalier attitude to the, the planning laws at the minute, I'm just wondering if that's a harbinger of, uh, of more laissez-faire and, and, and things? I, I don't, I, I've asked this obviously because it, it, it materially impacts our funding and our rationale for doing certain bits of research for our industry sponsors. I've run this past them and their view is they don't see the UK having a race to the bottom in terms of environmental legislation. So they expect harmonization of environmental legislation. 
uh, for a, a, as long as possible. Um, so I don't see anything changing rapidly soon. The interesting thing, of course, is that what will happen is you will see the UK. So you might find UK government departments being fined by the central government. So the money is, is it's kind of not going to an outside organization as a punitive fine. It's staying within the UK government. So how much of a deterrent that then becomes, I, I wouldn't uh, like to hesitate to, to guess at. Um, but I certainly don't see us uh, changing away from European environmental legislation. I mean, a, a lot of this stuff, the, the specific case of shellfish waste is an interesting one because when the legislation was passed, many European states could not meet the new legislation. So many of them put it in abeyance for many years. So it's not just the UK that, that kind of is impacted by some of these decisions. Thank you. Um, I'll just, uh, we've got a question from John Beatty next. John, just ask you to unmute. Yeah, thanks, fascinating. Um, it's a little like the, the first talk I ever came to at the Mining Institute. I'm not a mining engineer. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a linguist and so it's a, I approach it in a very different way and I, it certainly it's, it certainly made me think and I have to concentrate like mad which is a, which is an interesting challenge anyway but it, in a sense going on um, from the previous question the um, is it likely given the relatively small returns which are which are likely especially in the, in the near future is it likely that uh, and, and also given to the presumably the, the damage to the environment from the long term runoff from from lots of the areas that you've looked at, is it possible that that um, government funding could could come on stream to to help work, to help that particular work? So to, to 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 balance out the relatively small financial returns from it, and then. Um, I'm interested as well in the, the, the areas you looked at, the dark areas, which are, please leave them alone in, in one sense. Um, but and the, you, you talked about the lack of power in those areas. Uh, and, but they're also, they're, they're very wet, as you, as you quite rightly quite yeah. remarked, and had a, I've had experience of that. And they're also windy. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if, if power is a, an issue, um, I, are you are you working with with people in other disciplines to to respond to some of those problems and perhaps other ones that I haven't thought of? Yeah, okay. So I, I guess there's, there's there's a number of questions in there which I'll try and unpick apart. That the first one is government funding needed. Um, so when we started this, it was part of something called the Small Business Research Initiative. So the idea was to try and get together a range of technologies from different companies to be able to treat mine waters and make a business out of it. And they did it in a multi-phased approach. So phase one, they funded, I think it was about a dozen projects. Um, and then at the end of phase one, everybody had to present their results and we all presented our results. And then after the meeting, we, we had a, a, a puzzled email from the sponsor saying, but none of these schemes look like they'll ever pay their own way without government funding. And, and kind of the 12 people who'd been funded, if they could have done, would have looked at each other around the room and thought, Nowhere in the brief did anybody tell us we were supposed to make it self-funding. So it was a kind of little bit of a mismatch between expectation and, and reality there. Um, but yes, if you're treating water and the water itself hasn't got an intrinsic value for clean water, then you will need the government to spend money on it. Now, if the government is spending taxpayers on it, could I hand on heart say a filter system, even if we made the best one in the world, is a good idea? And I would probably say no, because once you put a filter system in place, it has to stay there forever because you're producing clean water, which meets legislative standards at the end of it. So you can't ever really take that away. So you have to pay for that thing into perpetuity. So if you are going to pay for filter systems using taxpayer money, you'd also better have a fund to fund research into what to do to get rid of the filter system. Otherwise, you end up footing the bill in, in far into the future far longer than you might otherwise anticipate. So I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical about long-term funding going into these as an endpoint solution. As an interim solution, fine, but you need to keep it funded on the other side of it. And ideally you want to move it from being a taxpayer shouldered problem to an industry uh, commercial problem because then it will drive its own um, cleanup 
uh, processes. So if you are recovering metals and making them into a high value products, that's great. But as I say, it will always, I think it was summed up to me once that all the metals in the UK mine pollution are about a week's production from a big metal mine in South America. So, you know, and the annual pollution from the UK is a, a drop in the ocean compared to the actual need for these metals. So almost what you need then, and one thing we have tried to get interest in, is a certification scheme. So you buy your um, shampoo with a nice little sticker on it that says, by buying this, you're helping the environment by removing metals from mine pollution. And I think that that's probably what's needed to help drive the market, which in turn will drive the investment in turning these pollution into manufacturing centers. Um, I quite agree that there are areas of staggering beauty, but there also tend to be areas of very little employment. So there's, there's a trade off in, in providing opportunities for people in those areas, as well as keeping the pristine nature of them. Um, was that the full question or was there, I can't remember, was there another bit on the end of it? Oh, you're muted. John. Just a little bit on the end of it, which was about about working with with um, with 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 other disciplines in oh, order yeah. to solve some of the some of the problems that, that yeah. might help help you along the way. Now, the, the, yeah. So yes, one of the interesting things about this, of course, is is um, we tend to have very narrow focus as academics. So we all have our favourite technology, which will promote to you know the best of our ability and. Uh, I've tried to stand back from this and look at this with a more holistic view. And we've done a lot of work with natural resources, Wales. So any filter, if we stick in with filters, will work best at low flow rates and high metal levels. So the way you get that in a metal mine is to stop the water going in a darn metal mine in the beginning so that most of your rainwater. So, you know, groundworks to move um, streams that are flowing directly into the mines that that helps and indeed natural resources whales have done that in some mines only to have local farmers redirect them back into the mine because it's a convenient way of keeping their fields slightly drier um, you can also look at you know one thing i began to think about when we looked at these mines because as you say the old miners used the water for um, hydraulic power generally for compressing air to use in their compressed air tools um, but also now in those sites of surrounding farms are using micro hydroelectric so you could use micro hydroelectric to provide you with some power, wind certainly. And if you had low energy pumps, you could also pump um, during the drier season, as much as it is in some of these areas, uh, to try and reduce the water in the mine so that you're not always having such a high outflow of very highly metalliferous water. If you've um, got sinkholes in the higher levels, you can pump water out before it reaches the seams. Actually, one of the things we'd love to do is actually generate proper digital models of these mines to understand. So you can have two adits next to each other, which behave very differently. So they're clearly receiving water inputs from different areas. And they're clearly transporting metals in different ways. And if you could understand the hydraulic conductivity and the structure of these mines underground, you could almost treat them then like a water treatment works where you can understand where all of the flows are interconnecting and what you need to do to to minimize those waters contacting the metal veins in the beginning. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we've got one question from Norman and then we'll have a question from one of our YouTube attendees. So Norman, I've just asked you to unmute. Norman Jackson from Seaton Sluice. Um, one thing that's always interested me as a mining engineer, we, we had a very, very good uh, barium sulfate plant at the uh, Backworth mines. Um, it, it did, in fact, make a, a good contribution to the running of the quarry in terms of cost. Mm -hmm. um, have, have you, have you, that water no longer comes to the surface. It's, it's, it's currently um, building up and combining with waters from beneath the tine. Have you done any work with that water at all? No, we haven't. But, but um, most, most of my day job uh, that, that, is, is a far more lucrative side research wise, if you like, is working with the drilling industry, the offshore oil and gas drilling industry. We work a lot on well bore stability. So of course, barite is, is a staple of their um, weighting agents within it. So there's a ready market for, for good quality barite for sure. And that, that is quite economical. I hadn't realized that resource was there to be honest with you, Norman. So perhaps we should catch up after this talk and have a chat. Well, there was, there was quite a big barium plant there that extracted quite a bit of barium. How easy it would be to get it out again now, um, I, I don't know. But the second one was, was I was very interested in your graph where you showed the, the water qualities. And, and the Bates water, it, it, again, is a very interesting water. 
because there was a di there was a direct connection to the Zechstein Sea, which, mm. uh, as you know, is 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 tremendously saline water, and uh, the 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 mine water at Bates was twenty seven times worse than sea water. Um, it used to rot the conveyor rulers, in, and we had to change the conveyor rulers in a three-month pattern on certain places, and it even used to rot the tour caps off your boots. Um, so that's another very interesting water, which uh, I noticed on your graph, it showed some quite high levels in what you are looking for. Yeah, waters which have got a high level of calcium in, in particular tend to be very good at phosphate removal. You form calcium phosphate, which is incredibly stable. So they're very, very good at removing uh, uh, phosphorus uh, on, on that basis. Um, I think Dawson also, because they add calcium uh, hydroxide to, to adjust the pH on it, then you also get quite high removal there. So if you have a high level of divalent cations like calcium or magnesium, then you tend to get very good phosphorus removal. Have you ever considered mixing the various mine waters to, um, to precipitate have, them out? I mean, I mean, the, the interesting thing is, is um, I, I suppose the the ochre project we mainly focused on the mines which were actively producing large amounts of ochre. So the the largest central point in the the northeast is Dorden, I think, at the moment. I think the okay. coal authority since then has built a new ochre handling facility further north as well. Um, so, you know, traditionally ochre was used in colouring bricks, um, but the market for that has fallen down. It's used a bit now in cement colorations. People like to have red cement and things. So um, there are uses for it, but what we're looking for is a sustainable long-term use for it. Um, and on one hand, you have a company that's buying a lot of iron salt, uh, which of course itself is going through a bit of a turbulent time because most of the iron salts you buy are a byproduct of the steel industry. And the steel industry is facing a lot of pressure over the last few years. So there's been a lot of volatility in the price of ferric sulfate in particular. Um, that's been compounded by countries in the Middle East have now got um, much more advanced water treatment works than they did 10, 20 years ago, which are also buying iron salts in uh, and slowly into South Asia as well. Um, as, as people begin to upgrade their infrastructure, uh, then they're also competing for the same resources that we would use in our water treatment works. So on one hand, you had um, water companies, Northumbrian Water, buying in iron salts. Um, and then on the other hand, you had the, the coal authority paying to put um, iron into the ground in the form of a salt or almost in the form of a salt as well. So synergistically for the Northeast, it, it works quite well. How, how well the economics would work if you had to ship it long distances, of course, is another question. Um, and the interesting thing is when you, you start looking at the economics, it requires both partnerships to be in a true partnership for it to pay off for either of them. It, it's the, the process as an aggregate is cost beneficial rather than for each part or just one of the partners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Norman. We have uh, one final question uh, from YouTube, and this has come from Katrina Selleck. Uh, I speak from a few months ago. Uh, Katrina says, fantastic talk, Chris. I was wondering how your bead treatment scheme compares to other water treatment options for these mine waters. Yeah, that, that's a good question. So um, I'm trying to think of the various systems that were trialed in, in the, um, so one, one of the old standard or, or the, the long term ways of treating some of these mine waters was to build um, constructed wetlands uh, and form iron precipitates and metal precipitates within the constructed wetlands. These don't tend to work in the Welsh Uplands Valley because the soil's too shallow. You get these big flood events. Um, you simply don't have the land area in some of those places. So the ones that we were, were came forward in the first round of the, the competition looking for companies, um, there were electrocoagulation and that has quite a small footprint. And that works very well. And in fact, there is a, a now a scaled up version of that at one of the mines um, further up the road from where we are, which is an even more mountainous terrain. Um, the problems with electrocoagulation are you need a generator of some sort on site, uh, which is a, a high value asset in a very remote location without uh, a security guard on site and, and particularly a very desirable asset in a very remote location. Um, so you have to have a, a secure, a very good security to stop it disappearing over the weekend or overnight. But more fundamentally, you need to replace the electrodes quite frequently. So just as we would need to go back and treat the, the beads, you would have to replace electrodes. Um, 
The other thing you get is quite a lot of a, a sludge, uh, an ochreous type sludge from electrocoagulation processes. As you dissolve your electrode, you're generating soluble metal ions, which um, help precipitate the other metal ions, um, and that generates a sludge in its own right. So that's the electro one of them, though it is a potentially, because of its small footprint and ease of operation, it is definitely a contender technology. Um, people have looked at using algae, uh, which again, you know, as in microalgae, live microalgae. The issue with that is if you're using a live microalgae rather than the processed polymers from one, uh, a Welsh winter isn't really conducive to growing much other than chiblins and uh, ailments. So you don't get much growth during the winter period, which tends to extend from about October to May. Um, and again, the infrastructure to run those systems with the dosing and nutrient control is, is quite a, a uh, expensive and fragile infrastructure in, in these mountainous locations. They can be very good if they're put on the side of a treatment plant of some site, a water treatment plant, but not in a, a remote geography. Um, you also get uh, people have looked at using other absorbents such as uh, calcium uh, limestone crushed limestone lined channels or even seashells because the limestone uh, the, the calcium uh, carbonate reacts particularly well with things like cadmium as well as increasing the pH to precipitate metals out. You then have the vertical flow ponds such as Adam Jarvis and the Coal Authority uh, have used to good effect at Force Crag in the lakes um, where you put a load of compost in wood and, and material that generates anoxic conditions. Uh, you get microorganisms that grow, which then um, form metal sulfides as part of their uh, respiratory process and precipitate out minerals similar to the original ores. Um, that's quite effective as a process, uh, you, but you then have to have a waste disposal route for the sludge that's formed. And because they're under reducing conditions, you also have to be able to treat any sour gas or H2S that's produced. So you tend to have to inject some sort of oxidant to get rid of the H2S, uh, which is both very smelly and very toxic, of course. Um, so you have to have a, a combined treatment system on that. That's, I mean, that's one of the few large mine treatment systems working effectively in the UK at the moment. Okay. Great. Thank you very much uh, for that answer, Chris. Comprehensive. I'm now going to hand over to Steve Martin for the vote of thanks. So, Steve, I've just asked you to unmute. Well, Chris, thank you very much indeed for an absolutely fascinating uh, talk. Uh, you have more or less given us so much uh, to absorb, a bit like your uh, biopolymer beads. <laughs> um, uh, but really, with your description of uh, cleaning up our past in a sustain sustainable way, and that uh, waste is discarding uh, and certainly needs recovery, um, and you gave us a full definition of waste, um, along with uh, when waste ceases to be waste, uh, when it's uh, recovered and uh, recycled, uh, you showed us how uh, geological wastes and uh, like slate left over from extraction processes and mining waste such as spoil heaps and uh, seaweed and even uh, even sewage. Um, you then went on to explain the use of buying oxyhydroxide, heavens above, I'm not a chemist, I'm all, I got it right, <laughs> oxyhydroxide uh, to clean up uh, in water treatment works by precipitation to remove phosphorus. And uh, you described how the filter works, which was very, very interesting. Uh, absolutely wonderful. Um, then you went on to uh, metal mining remediation, which uh, was talking about the removal of uh, lead, zinc, and cadmium. Uh, obviously, these names are, are big in, in the outside world. People who don't know anything about anything else tend to know about zinc and lead and cadmium. Uh, so that was very, very interesting. And you told us uh, how the uh, Fico uh, remediation, wonderful Fico remediation using uh, macro and, uh, and microalgae, uh, which can store zinc, uh, magnesium, copper, and, and nickel. Very, very interesting there. And then you demonstrated how the seaweed biopolymer beads you were used to remove these uh, materials. Uh, so I can't say much more than uh, you packed a heck of a lot into a very short time there. It was very, very interesting. And I'm sure that everyone here present will have enjoyed your, your speech there. Absolutely wonderful. And I'm sure they'd like to throw the, show their appreciation in the normal manner, uh, which is, I think we can actually put um, reactions on now, can't we? So we, 
as well as clapping. We can <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> we all say thank you very much indeed, Chris, for a very interesting lecture.